Hello and welcome along to Talking Sport. We're back bringing you this brand new series powered by Eleven Sports in partnership with iSports Connect. My name is Sid Coley. I'm a TV sports presenter and producer, and I'll be your host today. Now, you may have joined us when we kicked things off a fortnight ago with a fascinating discussion on the evolution of the sports rights model. And today we will discuss an incredibly important subject and one that involves both climate change and therefore reducing carbon footprint. It is, of course, sustainability in sport. A number of sport organizations have already pledged their commitment towards becoming carbon neutral or carbon negative in the not too distant future. The United Nations Sport for Climate Action Initiative, which aims to uphold the objectives of the 2015 Paris Agreement, has 143 signatures from leading sport organizations across the world, including La Liga, the New York Yankees, as well as Formula One. There's also a number of newer sports, such as Formula E, the Sale GP, and the highly anticipated Extreme E, all of which have sustainability at the core of their existence. And the trend isn't exclusive to motorsport, with Arsenal of the Premier League switching to 100% renewable energy back in 2017, and Forest Green Rovers of League Two becoming the first UN-certified carbon-neutral football club in 2018. Forest Green have since been granted permission to plan the world's first all-wooden football stadium called the Eco Park. So looking at some of these prominent examples, it starts becoming clear just how imperative sustainability is and how a number of sports are embracing it as a key priority. But what new technologies are being implemented towards becoming carbon neutral? What new partnerships are being formed to facilitate sustainability? And what are some of the ways in which sport could lead the way? These, among others, are the questions on today's agenda, where we are delighted to be in the company of an exceptional lineup of speakers. Joining us today, we have Ali Russell, Chief Marketing Officer, Extreme E. Hello, Ali. How are you? Good afternoon, Sid. Um, great to, to have um, this opportunity today, and, and thanks for getting us involved. Great to have you. Next, we have Peter Thomas, Chief Marketing Officer at Accenture. Good to have you with us, Peter. Thank you very much. Lovely to, uh, uh, lovely to join in the debate, because I think it's an important one. Very much looking forward to it. And finally, rounding off this panel is Henry Stalens, CEO at Forest Green Rovers Football Club. Glad you could join us, Henry. No problem. Good to be here, Sid. Moderating today's panel is Mike Penrose, founder and partner at the Sustainability Group. So a bit of housekeeping before we hand over to Mike. We recommend that you use the latest edition of Google Chrome for this particular series. Do say hello if you spot someone in the People tab, which should be visible on your window right next to the chat section, where we do encourage you to get involved. But if you have any questions for our panelists, of which I'm sure there'll be plenty, please use the questions tab and you can upvote the questions you would most like to see our panelists answer. We'll also have a couple of audience polls throughout the session, the first of which should be on your screens now. And the question is, which one of the following green initiatives do you think will play the most crucial role? You have five options, which are renewable energy, reduced single-use plastic, plant-based food, electric transport, and finally, energy efficiency. Please do participate in that poll and we will reveal the results a little later on. Now, one final tip before we move on to the panel, you'll find a bell icon on the top left of your screens. Now, to mute any incoming notifications and to avoid any distractions, please click on the bell icon now. Do please keep your questions coming, get involved in the chat, but above all, we hope you immerse yourselves in what promises to be a very timely and very important discussion. Well, that's all from me. Mike, the floor is yours. Sid, thank you very much for that introduction. And it, it, it's a real pleasure to, to moderate such a, a, an amazing panel here. Um, 
For me, this panel is so important because sport, I believe, has an enormous capacity to influence in a way that nothing else does in people's lives. So I think it bears a lot of responsibility, both for sort of conveying a positive message and helping impulse the change that we know we need to see across all industries. And I think, you know, having a panel like this with such experience and how that can be achieved in a positive way, I think can be a great example to the sporting community. So, but I think we, we've gone through a very strange initial phase, uh, uh, last few months. We, we, a lot of people are calling COVID a dress rehearsal for climate change and a dress rehearsal type of, of things we will have around climate change. And I'd just be interested to hear, uh, as a panel, your uh, opinions on how you think sport has fared over the last few months in terms of supporting the communities which it, which it works in, uh, the, the people that, that are, are so uh, passionate about what you represent. How do you think we've done and what lessons do you think we can learn from, from the last few months? And maybe we start with Peter on that one, Peter. Wow, uh, thanks for choosing the person who probably is less day-to-day -day involved with sports apart from a, a, as, a, as a spectator. But I mean, I think, you know, the sports industry inevitably was always going to be hit hard because, you know, live sport is the, uh, the absolute core of everything that brings, brings it to life. So, and when you can't do live sport either on the field and having spectators, then that has been um, a challenge. I think, you know, I would say observationally from the outside in, because to an extent that is my perspective. Yeah, I think sport has taken a you know good and sensible and you know um, measured approach to getting back to playing. But I, I yeah I would say I think I remain amazed that in in the environment as it remains globally, you know there are live sports happening. So I think credit to any sport that's managed to get back on the field um, and the measures they put in place for that. I, I think it is um, nonetheless true that you know until you can actually spectate properly and have live live audiences, whether they're online or offline, yeah, you know, it's always going to be a little less than we would hope for. Uh, but I do think it's uh, the sports sector has you know been responsible. I guess would be a good word for it, and and thought carefully about what's going to um, you know what's going to work for them. At one level, of course, none of us had any choice but to do anything else, but. Yeah, you know, I do think yeah, you know, it's good to see sport up and running because it does affect the morale of nations, and I think that is yeah you know, probably a yeah you know, as much as it can do at the moment. And, and Henry, what are your thoughts? Because I think that thought's really important about the morale and the mental health issues that sports can help overcome. I think. Yeah, I think you know, it's been about five months without normality in in sport, especially in football, and. It, it's made me realise, and everyone associated with, you know, especially football, because I can only talk from from that point of view, um, just how much it means to people. Um, so yes, they turn up on a Saturday, but they're actually looking forward to it all week. It gives them that release on a weekend. So to have, you know, you know, no release to being locked down or whatever it might be. So yeah, it, it's been really, really tough. Um, it's quite clear that this has obviously never happened before. So we didn't have a plan for it as a as a community. Um, the, probably the hardest thing for us uh, is the elder generation of fans. So the season ticket holder that's been coming to the club every Saturday for, I don't know, 60 years or something, and, you know, that they suffer from loneliness. They might be single. They, you know, um, that's, that's their time to get out of the house and um, that's their socialising spot. So we've had to work really hard, um, our community team, reaching out to them with phone calls, visits, social distance, obviously. So, yeah, it's been particularly hard. Um, and I think even now with only 25% of fans coming back to football stadiums, um, people will take what they can and, and then we'll build from it. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Ali, slightly different question from you, moving for you moving on. Um, Extremely is, uh, I think many of us consider it to be an ex extremely exciting prospect. Uh, and it, it's been built really with social purpose at its core from, from gender diversity within the drivers through to your, the environmental um, values you're hoping to, to, to uphold. What's the, the vision for Extreme E. Expl explain to us a little bit what your objective is and what, is, what are the values that underpin your organization? Thanks for that, Mike. Um, first of all, I'll just quickly go back to COVID because I, I think it's fascinating and I, I don't think the sports community gets enough credit for how it's dealt with, with COVID. I think the one thing that I, I've known about people working in sports is planning is not the norm, firefighting is the norm. And so when you're dealt with a huge challenge like COVID, People have to get back to basics, get back to their audiences, 
be part of their communities and, and do the right thing. And, and I think sports clubs and football clubs and rugby clubs and cricket clubs across you know the world have been agile and have been there for their communities. So I think it's one of the sort of things that I think sports should be quite pleased with itself in terms of how it's reacted to this. Now, if we take that stage on, and I think the, the purpose of this uh, conversation is um, really about sustainability and about climate change. Um, we uh, set up a number of years ago a sport called Formerly, which was a sport with purpose. And clearly the, uh, the drive at the time was to have clean air in cities and to tackle um, emissions. And 30% of global emissions are through transportation. So, you know, dealing with the electric vehicle is, is um, a, a decision that all of us can make in terms of moving from combustion engine to uh, electric vehicle really does help the planet and it really does help clean air. And so, you know, with, with Extremi, it's really just going that stage further. And, 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 and Mike, you're right, it's, it's, it's creating a proposition and a sport for purpose. So all we're, we exist for is to help communicate climate change and what is happening in different parts of the world. So, you know, people say to us, you know, why are you racing the Amazon? The reason we're racing in the Amazon is because you know, clearly the message of climate change isn't getting through to people. Um, uh, BAFTA and, and uh, Deloitte did a scrape of all content last year in, um, in, in, in UK broadcast industry outside of news. And they found that Brexit was the number one topic, followed by God, followed by cake. And number 36, after dogs, cats, Shakespeare, you name it, number 36 was climate change. So, um, you know, the, 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 the climate emergency that now exists is serious. It's probably the most defining aspect of all of our lifestyle, lifetimes. And, you know, we need to do something about that. And we happen to believe that sport, as I said before, can be very agile, can be very, very specific. And what we're looking to do is to take a sport which historically has been about big engines and, and, and performance and everything else. We're taking that sport, we're taking electric vehicles, and our vehicles are 100% electric, and we're taking them to the, the, the four corners of the earth. So Arctic, Amazon, um, the, 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 the middle of the desert, you know, coastal areas that are suffering from, from rising sea levels. And we're showing what devastation is happening to these communities. We're not driving on you know, the beautiful tropical jungle. We're driving on areas that used to be jungles that have been burnt down due to, to rising temperatures or have been deforested. And what we're doing is we're, we're, you know, sending out the message that the planet is under attack at the moment. It's under attack from the human race. And we're also trying to be quite optimistic in terms of the, the, the innovations and the ability for people to innovate through our series, you know, not just through vehicles, not just through in terms of electric vehicles, but even, you know, we, we, you know, your whole topic there was, you know, what, what are the areas that we can be more sustainable? We're, we're looking at how do we reduce our footprint? So we're measuring and we're reducing our footprint. We're also looking at choices. So, you know, we, we had a choice of did we fly the, 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 the um, cars around the world or you know, do we invest in a ship which went around the world as a mobile paddock? That's roughly 75% reduction in our in our carbon footprint. So we have that sort of understanding and, and we, we've made those positive decisions. We've also gone with hydrogen fuel cell, which means the, that we, we create the hydrogen through, um, through uh, solar power effectively. So the hydrogen's created through the sun. We then charge battery. The battery then charges the cars. The cars work on, on zero carbon footprint. And then the only byproduct is water, which we then clean the cars at the end of the racing. So, you know, the purpose of our, our series is to, to highlight and then help, you know, the big car companies and companies that are all thinking about how do we become more sustainable and helping them tell their stories through sports. And, and, and that's really the, the grasping of it. I, I, that the stories there, and also what you're trying to exemplify, I think it, it is really important. Um, Henry, you, you you seem to have a very similar goal here in terms of using sport also to exemplify the change we need to make uh, in society if we're going to take things like climate change seriously. 
What are some of the significant changes that you've made in the club that has led to you becoming, and I believe you were referenced by both the UN and FIFA as being the most sustainable football club on the planet? Yeah, so when um, Dale, the chairman, Dale Vince, took over the football club in 2010, um, he set about um, bringing sustainability to a sort of untapped, um, I guess, industry, which is football. So people never really had it, sustainability put in front of them as a message. Um, things, you know, really straightforward things that are not straightforward to implement, but straightforward things for people to understand that we've done. Um, we're powered by 100% green energy. Um, mm -hmm. We 100% um, vegan menu for fans and players. Um, the the lawn, uh, the pitch mower is powered by the sun, um, so it's called the Mobot, and it gets you know that gets its own column inches in, in various papers. Um, it, like I said, all the players are, are vegan. Um, we've got electric car charging points out the front. Um, we offset travel, um, so team coach, supporter coach, uh, we offset travel. But one thing we're looking at, or we were looking at for this season, was offsetting the travel of away fans to us. So that would be included in the price of their ticket. Um, it wouldn't inc increase the price of the ticket, but it'd be included in it. The thought of increasing the price of the ticket to offset their um, footprint, which would have brought us more uh, more social media trolling than we already get. And um, it was just, um, yeah, we, we, we were building stage by stage um, to the point that we became carbon neutral in 2018. Um, FIFA labelled us as the greenest football club in the world in 2017 and we, we reach about 4 billion people through our uh, media reach so it's been a really good journey but we're just keeping pushing the envelope because a lot of clubs now are coming to us for advice which we really appreciate um, and yeah the more we can do then the more the message gets out there and the more people get on board. Well, one thing you said there, I'd just like to, to, to ask a, a question on that intrigues me, because um, Ali said earlier about transport being one of the biggest impact on climate change. The other, the other one is, is food consumption and is meat. So obviously you've made a, a decision to go vegan. Um, but in a sport that's famous for burgers and meat pies at half time, how did that go down with the fans? How the, the fans that have been coming to you for 30, 40 years, how did it go down? <laughs> Uh, indifferent um, would be a polite way to put it. So uh, Ali's completely right. The, the, the three main things are energy, transport and food. Um, mm. So if, if, if organisations can tackle those three things, they're well on their way um, to making a huge change. Um, we still serve beer, we still serve pies, but it, you'll get a, a Q pie, uh, so corn pie, um, yeah. which is an award-winning pie. It's exactly the same as, you know, it tastes exactly the same, if not better than, than other um, meat pies. And then the organic beer, the organic vegan beer. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're just showing that it can be done in a different way. Fantastic. Um, Peter, uh, we've spoken a lot and you've spoken in the past about sport benefiting the wider world. Uh, and OK, we're talking about sustainability here, but, but I think you and I both agree that sustainability means something far broader than just climate change. Um, where do you think sport has the potential to have the greatest impact? Well, I've done. So I would very quickly, uh, you are absolutely right. So in our version of it, sustainability, of course, environment, of course, climate change, you know, as Ali said, you know, an existential threat to our planet and our future, but also, um, you know, uh, what kind of responsible business are you? you know, sustainability for us is about the ability for us to be an ethical business in the future and have a, an ethical supply chain. It's about, as you mentioned, the start inclusion, diversity and, and doing the right things. Um, so I, so, uh, you know, just to set that as context, I think, you know, sport has, I think, three areas particularly where I think it, um, it has real power. Um, the first and obvious one, and everybody's referred to that, is as the platform. You know, the elite, at the elite end of, of, of sport, a platform on which brands and also the sport itself can talk about these topics and they resonate with fans. Um, and so, you know, sport has a a power to move people and change opinion and and it has the opportunity to think about how it does that but there is also you know the opportunity for those sports that have a grassroots um, um infrastructure to be a be a platform to communicate these around these kind of issues down into those grassroots as well so i think all sports need to perhaps think a little bit about both of that but that's the sport as a platform but then there's sports as a business as well which is you know are you, you know, walking the talk, I guess? You know, Are you running yourself as an organisation the way that clearly uh, Henry is with Forest Green Rovers as an ethical, responsible and sustainable business? Are all of the things that you're doing in your business operations um, sustainable 
um, for the planet and for your business and for your for your staff. So think about how you operate the business as well. Um, and um, you know, and, and a number of people, you know, and I think I say Forest Green Road is a good example of that. And the final one is, you know, on the field of play, however you define that, you know, in the way in which, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, how can you put sustainability in any of its definitions? And that this probably is much more around environment and climate at the heart of the sport you that you're you're doing. And whether that is, you know, extreme E is obviously a very vivid example of that you know where you're it's absolutely at the heart of the sport you're competing in um i know it's happening a lot in in, um, in sailing and ocean going racing as well um uh, and obviously you know it, it, where the, where the action formula one as well where um yeah i think environmental issues have kind of been there in the past and i think are being addressed so you know can you use sport as a platform for these topics to 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 change opinion are you as a sporting body, natural governing body, uh, club, um, whatever you are, running your business as a, as, as a sustainable business and in the sport that you play on the field of combat, whatever that looks like, are you considering um, environmental and sustainable issues in every single way from, you know, solar powered mowers to, you know, um, you know better use of the wind um, in sailing or whatever it is, you know, I think there is a, those are the ways that I would you know, suggest sport can change opinions more than just beyond allowing brands like myself a platform to talk about you know, how, how, how amazing we are in sustainable, on sustainable topics. I, I think you've pulled out one issue there that, that I'd just like to chase a little bit that I think is incredibly important. Obviously, you know, both Extreme and, and Forest Green have, have embraced this as their social purpose. But as we know, to get widespread change, you need to have both uh, a solid moral case and a solid business case. So I'd be really interested, Ali, maybe what, for you, what is the business case beyond just the social for going to the, the levels you have in terms of the environment, in terms of the equality you're trying to represent and the social purpose that you embody? Yeah, I, I think Peter's right. Um, you know, when we go into this, I think sport for, for a start is, is it's a passion point. So what we're, we're using is people's passions, you know, and let's not forget we're in the Netflix generation now and sport is still incredibly sticky. So people want to watch sport. And, and I think the lockdown over the last five months without sports or with limited sport has really shown us how much we've missed sports. So I think there's a bringing together. Now, we, we happen to believe that, that what we're doing is um, creating a platform for the car industry. So our target is really the car industry. So that's people like Porsche, Audi, Mercedes, BMW, um, Neo, Mahindra, Nissan, Toyota. Those are the those are the car companies that, that, that we're targeting because we feel that we can be a, an exceptional um, research and development hub for them to test new technology. And you know the equivalent is if you look at Formula One, they say you know one year of racing is equivalent to ten years of um, of R and D. And that's because of the, the pressure that racing puts on, on these engineers to, to come up with, with new ideas and new aspects. And in, in formerly when we started, you, you might laugh at this, but the, um, the, the battery wouldn't last a full race. And so what we had was, um, it, for those of you that watched in season one, you would drive into the pits halfway through and you'd jump out of one car and get it into a second car. And then the car would go out and would race the the, the rest of the the race, and and it was a great deal of jeopardy, and it was a, it was a, it was a really interesting part of the championship. But the point was, if you drove an electric car very fast, the 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 battery went down very very quickly, and over the five first five years of racing, we were able to develop battery technology enough that actually in, in season six of Formula E. You have one car, one battery, and it it, it carries out the, the same length of race. And that's a really good example of what racing can do. It's done it with, with fuel control, traction control, um, sorry, fuel injection, traction control, uh, seat belts, wing mirrors. All these innovations have come from racing. And what we're hoping is we are focusing the, the, the technical development around our series, around the drivetrain, the inverter, and the software. And we're also trying to, to get people from different backgrounds to, to get involved. So not just 
you know, quite affluent males. We're, we're trying to get a diversity throughout the sports. And, and, and uh, Mike, I think you alluded to there, we, we, we're trying to, to um, create a new proposition, which is much shorter in terms of its time span. So if you look at Formula One, it's across multiple days. You know, our races are over 12 kilometers, so around about nine minutes. So it's meant to really, really target a much younger audience, the Snapchat generation. And we have men and women racing. So each team, and we, we've, I have to say we've nicked this from, from tennis and, and from mixed doubles, but each team has a man and a woman on the team. So the first lap is done by driver A, and the second lap is done by driver B. And A or B can be male or female, but one must be a male and one must be a female. And what we feel is, is that doesn't just break down the barriers. What that gives us is it gives us a product which is really future-proof because there is absolutely no reason that, that female drivers aren't driving at the very, very peak of motorsport. The issue is, is there just isn't enough opportunity for, for females coming through to drive and to have the time in the car to be able to drive. So what we've we've done is we've created an opportunity where it's fair between teams you choose the best two drivers you can choose and they fight against each other and the product is exactly the same and we think what it does is it helps to, to create role models for for males and females so we've got a very good message here in terms of the big message is about climate change is about sustainability and sustainability at its core but also, why can't we try to engineer what a sport should be like in the future? So we're bringing, you know, parts of gaming into into Extreme E, where you know, if you're if you jump the jump the the, the furthest over the hyperdrive, then you you get more power on your your second lap. So that lends itself more to Mario Brothers than it does to Formula One. So we've tried to to stick to a model which is aimed at. I, I suppose the decision makers of tomorrow, so a, a much younger generation, so that's Gen Z and millennials, and we've tried to talk to them through sports, through esports, and through making the product and engineering the product, you know, in such a way which it becomes really digestible and really easy to understand and, and, and to follow. So what we hope is if we make it as sticky as possible, then the, 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 the aspects of sustainability can, can start to, to seep in and people can, can make their own decisions. We're, we're not being holier than now saying you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. What we're talking about is these are some of the choices you can make and these, these are the impacts those choices can make. And we're trying to leave it to the individual to, to, to relate to that. So I'm not saying that we're, we're any, any better than any of the other sports. We just happen to have a real clarity of, of vision and purpose um, and we want to be the, the motorsport proposition of tomorrow. Absolutely. And I, th I think it, it, it's an exemplary model. Um, Henry, when you obviously the changes that you've made uh, and, and from the new stadium to all the things you put in place probably cost quite a bit of money. What was the business case that you put in front of the people to make those changes in order to get the financing you need? I think Henry's maybe frozen there. I think we have frozen Henry there, yes. Yeah. Can you hear me, Henry? No, we, we may have lost him, so I'll, I'll move on. Um, there's actually a, a poll to be, to be um, asked now. So uh, as explained before, there's a polls function here. And the poll coming up was, does sport need to do more to push me messaging, push messaging out about creating a better planet? Are we doing enough or does more need to be done across sport as a whole? So the poll is coming up now and please vote on that one. Um, Peter, you've mentioned in the past about, um, or, or, or Accenture has mentioned in the past about wanting to your entire business to be more eco-friendly, more environmentally sustainable uh, and more sustainable in the, in the way that you explained it. So when you're looking at sports partnerships and working with organizations, what sort of audit or, or, or um, uh, sort of review do you do of your partners before you choose to work with them? I, I think it has to be you know, central. You, you're right. We set great store by um, these the, these themes as an, uh, the way we operate our business um, around environment, around inclusion, diversity, all of those things. So it would then be um, nonsensical to start entering into partnerships with sports organizations or any organizations frankly where uh, they didn't have those same targets goals and values um, as you had because 
you know you are the company you keep right that's what uh, sponsorship's about and i see there's a there's a question from bethany which alludes to this which is you absolutely have to align it you know the old sponsorship model of give me your money and i will promote your brand you know that is not that is gone you know it is now a better an integrated partnership where you share values you share vision and you work together in partnership above the line and below the line to make that story come to life for both of you, for both parties. This isn't just about you telling my story, this is about me telling your story. So, so an absolute core part when we do start the evaluation and, and, and conversations with any partner um, will be about you know, um, you know, their position on these issues and not just you know, what they say about it, but what, how they run their business you know, and how they run their sport. And you know, I would I would echo you know um, what Ali was talking about, which is things like you know, are they a mixed, a diverse sport? Or do they have opportunities for men and women at the core of the sport rather than as an afterthought? Um, and so I think that's an important thing. You know, again, back to environment. You do they you know do they have an impact on the planet? At least make sure they don't have an adverse impact on the planet. And where possible, do they have a positive impact on the planet? So I think it has to be at the core of it. Yeah, if you were to be a um, data data driven about it, it is part of the scorecard that we would run any proposition through. You know, would be scored and and the the um, you know the the elements of of um, sustainability that, that that sport and that sporting organisation and rights holder you know display and um, demonstrate and um, uh, would be a core part of how we think about it because you have to. You know, sit alongside partners who believe the same things you do. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Henry, great to have you back. Um, uh, back, to, back to the question that, that we asked before. What what was the business case you put to the people who financed the changes you've made? Yeah, I think that was Storm Francis. I'll, I'll speak quickly. Um, the, the, the business case is actually straightforward. People think that going green is, tip, is tough. Um, or difficult or whatever but i think it's probably the opposite if you if you flip it on its head so we attract bigger sponsorship deals than anyone else at our level um because we are effectively the, the pinnacle for any brand that's already green or wants to become more sustainable sustainability conscious because that's the way that the consumer wants people to go so people will pay a lot more money to sit alongside us and align with us and get our pr reach um the if you look at the really you know right down to the minutized stuff the margins on vegetables are a lot bigger than the margins on meat. So we're selling a, a pie or a hospitality, et cetera. We're making more money per head than clubs that are buying in chicken, beef, whatever it might be. So yes, there are expensive technologies, um, but once you've implemented them, if, you know, longer term, you're going to reap the rewards. So solar's fairly expensive to install, but over the years, the, you know, the, the reduction in energy bills is going to be, is going to be far greater. So we don't look at, you know, short term, stuff is doesn't make any sense for any business to do that um yes there are moments when you might do that from a cash point of view but longer term business will always benefit from becoming sustainable for the right reasons Brilliant. and and obviously making all these changes to the, the 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 club that a lot of your supporters are very passionate about how did you engage with them how did you get them on board with everything you were doing and what was the sort of um outreach that you did to bring all the supporters along with you I wouldn't say they're all along with us yet. I'd say there's there's sort of two two types of fan that we've got. We've got the old school fan that still doesn't buy into it all, but at least they're discussing it. So there's a conversation. So mm. it's always in the front of their agenda. They'll you know they'll say to us, "We're going to bring along a ham sandwich," and they'll post pictures of it on social media. And we're absolutely fine with that. People can eat what they want. They can drink what they want. We're just not going to be the ones to to serve the meat um, meat products. So again it's a discussion isn't it so the, every time someone slates us on twitter or whatever it's again it's their mind which had never been in football before so the other the other part of it is our community outreach program so we do a lot of work in schools um we work in about 250 schools locally where players and community staff will go in and they'll teach them about recycling or comp composting or green energy um things that kids don't you know maybe in the past haven't been taught about um, enough. So it's a slow journey, but I would say that the upside of what we've done is far outweighed any negative um, to it. Brilliant. 
Um, Ali, you mentioned earlier that one of the aspects you're looking at is the logistics around how you're going to move moving around the world. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? How you came to the conclusions to uh, to, to sort of reduce your car carbon footprint, and also some of the measures you're doing to do that? Because obviously, you know, sailing isn't viable e e everywhere. So, how how are you achieving that low carbon footprint logistics that that's essential in sport? Well, it, it, you know, it was. Um, it... I suppose through measurement and through measurement in 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 informally, we've got a really good understanding of, you know, around about eight percent of the footprint was through transportation um, of the series from from point A to point B, um, and what we looked at was how do we reduce that further? And reducing it further, you can do that considerably by using shipping as opposed to air freight. And so we looked to what we could do with, with shipping. We found that it was really, really difficult for us to, to, to have the agility that we needed around the racing series to do anything but to purchase our own ship. So we've, we've got quite a romantic story. We, um, we fell in love with a ship that was, it's called the St. Helena. And it used to take um, goods and people from Cape Town to the island of St. Helena, which is well known uh for napoleon and in, in terms of he was interned there um till the end of his life and and um the the island has always been so rocky that it could never have an airport and um the the, the residents have had to go back and forth across this treacherous atlantic crossing using this the the, the boat or the ship saint helena Anyways, to make a long story short, um, the uh, island was able to um, create an airport and they no longer needed the ship. And it was ideal for us because it could be a mobile paddock. So the, the, the uh, cars themselves go in the front end of the ship and all the participants can, can be housed on the ship, which means that we reduce any impact on, on the local environment. So four of the races, every single person in the series will be staying on the ship itself and you know the the engineers will be working on on, on the ship on on the cars themselves and then they'll be un unloaded brought to the venue will race in the venue um we've we've taken a lot of steps so that the biggest one i think has been using a ship to 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 run the whole series um and then we've gone through absolutely every single part of of, of our processes so for instance from a tv point of view it's a TV product. We don't have fans at location. And so the TV pictures and the media product is, is, is effectively our only product. And it's really, really important. But what we wanted to do was to ensure that we limited the number of people on site. So we have gone full remote production. So yes, the cameraman and elements of the talent will be on site, but everything else will be back in, in London. And so we'll, we'll take the live feed back to London um, it'll be semi-finished, then it'll have the graphics, the, the, the commentators, the feeds will all be put on and then it'll be distributed to our, our, our partners. And that happens in a, in a matter of seconds. So you at home will not see any difference to, to remote production. And, um, you know, that, that's been, you know, some of the, the, the major sort of aspects. We, you know, we talked about plant-based foods and we've got a, a really um, uh, uh, smart relationship with a company called uh, Neat Meat. Um, who are going to be making a variety of different foods for us, and, and, and agree with Henry. It's you know it, it, I, I challenge people to to notice the difference between some of these products. They're 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 so good. So we we've approached things uh, mainly through a scientific community community that we or a committee that we've set up, which is um, you know it's half Oxford, half Cambridge in terms of the professors that are involved. And each of them is a specialist on on each of the locations we go to. So, you know, Peter Wadham's head, heads it up, had 55 Arctic expeditions, and uh, he's tasked with um, finding the right location, ensuring that when we go on location, we don't damage the location, and then he's in charge of legacy projects when we leave. And the legacy projects are really, really important because it's, how do we become um, incredible neighbors? And, and you know, Henry uh, alluded to this earlier, but you know, football clubs everywhere are are looking at how they can be good neighbors. Now we're taking this this, I suppose, um, uh, sport into these environments where 
you know, there are very, very few people and the, pe the indigenous people there need to get some sort of benefit from, from us being there. And that benefit is both from a sustainability point of view, but also from an economical point of view. And so we've got uh, 100 hectares of Amazon rainforest being regenerated as a, as a consequence of us going to the Amazon. We're planting over a million mangroves on the coast of Africa as part of um, combating the, the erosion um, from, from storms. And, you know, I, I think Henry was talking about the storm he's, he's going through at the moment. But those are the sort of things we do. And, and mangroves themselves are incredibly good at storing carbon. So it's got that dual sort of focus. So really, we've, we've tried to, to, to bring measurement as, as the, the, the focal point. So understand carbon footprint as being the number one uh, aspect. And then making decisions along the way which you know they don't have to be uh, negative economically for your business and in many cases they can actually be quite positive and then how do we bring in uh you know an element to legacy to, to yeah. each location we're going to which actually we're we're making the commitment we're planting the million mangroves but it could be two million mangroves by the time that the fans um uh, uh raise money for for those different initiatives by the time the teams but but by the time our partners, people like Continental, people like Neobium, um, you know, get involved with us, people like Louisa Via Roman, you know, every single person that's getting involved in this championship is thinking about how do we think smarter? What do we do to, to have a, you know, a, more of a demonstration of sustainability and how can our business become more sustainable? So very, very much um, what, what, what Peter was talking about earlier. Uh, P Peter, to that, to one of the points raised by Ali, um, you know, you work for Accenture. You are the the, the kings and queens of measurement. Um, you know, that's your that's your business. Um, and there is that adage that, that was alluded to there, Ali, that you treasure what you measure. Um, what should clubs that are wanting to take sustainability, your definition of sustainability in sports, seriously? What should they start with? What should they start measuring before anything else? Well, I mean, that, yeah, the obvious answer from any consultant is always going to be it depends. <laughs> um, yeah, it depends on the business they are and the sport they are. But I, I mean, I think, you know, as I say, and I, I and to an extent, you know, we have a whole um, division that does sustainability consulting that I'm sure has a, you know, a comprehensive scorecard of how organizations in the round should think about their impact on the planet and sustainability in, in its broadest context. So, um yeah, but I think yeah, when when we look at um, what we, we what we want to see from partnership, I like if I you know, move it to a little bit more from a sponsorship perspective. Um, you know, we want to know that, as I said before, what we want to know is that in in sustainability, uh, not only are they able to talk about the, the the changes they want to make, but they are measuring them in some way, shape, or form. And I think it's important to note, you know, I wouldn't sit here and expect a sports organisation to have the same ability to measure itself and its impact as a $45 billion business with half a million people like us do. You know, we're looking for people to show that they um, they have the same vision and values, not that they are able to fund multi-million pound metrics programs and dashboards. Um, and in fact, in, in, in many cases, or in some cases, one of the things we like to do with, with partners where we do have them is help them on those things so you know valuing kind services is a big part of all of our partnerships where we have them and so um as long as we believe a sports in this case organization is trying to achieve the right things and has put in place the structures and vision to do that and wants our help to you know deliver against some of that then we you know we make that part of the deal where we can so i don't think you can look at any organization and say the three things you need to measure, um, um, you know, are these. That said, you know, for ourselves, you know, in the environment, you know, we do start because you do need some measure with carbon footprint. And, um, you know, that is, you know, because of our travel bill, as you would expect, you know, that is a, a significant place for us to start. So, you know, there are some sim similarities, but I, I'm not sure you could look at any organization and say, if you measure these three things, you're going to prove that you're sustainable. Um, because all businesses are different and all sports are different and they're coming from different places and they're different sizes. Um, but I think it's having the you know, the intent and um, then being willing to live up to that intent that is important. So 
absolutely. absolutely. Um, Henry, the Eco Park. Tell us about the Eco Park. You know, obviously, we've heard it's the first all wooden stadium, but but give us a little bit more de uh, detail on it. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, no, it's not. Um, it's going to be the world's first um, fully wooden stadium, um, built about six miles from where we are at the moment, um, just off the junction of M, uh, M5, Junction 13, um, designed by Zaha Hadid, architect, um, who, you know, designed, you know, amazing stuff, um, iconic world features. So we thought it needed to be done that sort of justice. So it's, it's been in planning for five years. Um, but as you know, as, as my chairman told me, his first uh, wind turbine, uh, when he pretty much invented green energy back in 96, took him six years to build. So this has been quite speedy. Um, so it, it's been planning for five years. We finally got outline planning. We're now on the detailed consent. And we do hope that it will be ready in sort of three to four seasons time. Mm -hmm. And it will not only have the stadium on one side of the junction, but on the other side, it will have, um, it will have um, a business park, uh, uh, which will create 4,000 jobs in the, green, um, in the green sector. So it's really exciting for us. It's pretty much the natural con conclusion to what, we, what we've done. We've already got the, the greenest football stadium in the world. It, the next thing to do is go and build a, you know, a 60 million pound um, wooden stadium. So yeah, we're really looking forward to it. I did. It sounds absolutely amazing. Um, we're getting quite a lot of questions in and, and I, several of you have mentioned things about your partnerships and how you take your sponsors and partners along. But uh, uh, especially to um, uh, Henry and Ali, when you're looking at sponsors, when people are coming to you, obviously, for, with sponsorship money, what are you looking at in terms of the credentials they bring that represents your brand, your values and what you're trying to achieve? Yeah. Um... Thanks for that. I, I think it's about storytelling and, you know, we're, we're quite open on, on, on these sort of things. You know, people talk about good companies and bad companies. We think we've all got to become more sustainable. So, you know, if, if BP come along and, and they're investing in, in charging facilities globally and they want to tell a story of fast charging, then why wouldn't it be our responsibility to help them to do that? So, you know, really for us, it's, it, 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 it's about, is there a story? Is there a connection here? I, I think we've gone past that sort of brand awareness where we're going to stick a, stick a sticker on a car or on some hoardings. You know, that, that's not really where we're at. We're about how can we use a media product in a, in a very, very compelling way where we use athletes, we use scientists, we use lo what we call local legends to tell really, really good stories that are curated in a way with this magnificent backdrop. You know, we, we talk about this being Blue Planet meets, you know, Dakar on speed, you know, so these environments are incredible. And what we're able to do is to really curate and capture the imagination of, of, of the customer and tell a story. So if there's a story to be told and that, that story is worthwhile, then, you know, we, we're, we're quite open for business in terms of working that forward. and, and you know, it's been interesting because Luisa Villaroma are an online fashion house, and, and fashion has a has a challenge with sustainability as a as a as a um, as an industry. And and what they've looked at is they're working through. So they're at the very very start of their sustainability program, and they're working with a lot of the brands that they're they're in partnership with, and how these brands can come together and 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 be you know more interactive, more cooperative in terms of making the industry more sustainable. I, I find that quite interesting because that's when you have real impact. You don't have real impact by the St. Helena becoming electric in the future. You have real impact by getting, you know, the, the biggest merchants of the world to, to, you know, make changes to their fleets, which, you know, go from, from heavy marine diesel to light marine diesel. You know, those are, those are the big impacts. And I'm just trying to to be absolutely honest, it's impact for us first, and and um, you know that's what we look at. Henry, I, I imagine that a lot of sponsors come to you, and you know there's been lots of scandals in the press, especially major consumer brands around the the label greenwashing. How do you make sure that the the people that come to you and want to sponsor you aren't just looking for that? Yeah, I, I think I was going to mention that word. So I think the first thing we look for is honesty. Um, do they want to do it for the right reasons? Um, and they're not just trying to greenwash or jump on that on that bandwagon. Um, and after that, it's similar to what Ali said, you know, how cool a story can we tell? How far can we reach with it? So 
the brands that we work with are typically, they may not have the same media reach as us, but they're huge companies um, that are known worldwide. So if you look at some of our biggest partners, they're the likes of Corn, Candrium, mm -hmm. um, Sea Shepherd from a, from a charity perspective. So they've got their own sort of cult followings. So what can we do with them? Um, but yeah, we, we turn down sponsors, all, you know, partners all the time. There's, there's one uh, local one that comes to us every year, which is the local butcher shop down the road who just wants to buy a board. And it, it's the most, <laughs> every year it's the same response. It's, it's probably no. So um, yeah, we, we attract some of the biggest sponsors in the world. Um, and for us, we, what what can we do with them that's different? What can we do with them that's eye-catching? So, you know, two years ago, some, a, a company came to us and said, we can make the kits out of bamboo. Okay. And you know, a year you know, a year later, we're wearing the world's first um, bamboo football kit. So, if a lot of people come to us with a proposition, we ask them to go away and, and prove it. And if they can do it, then you know, we'd love to align with them. Fantastic. Um, we've only got about five minutes left. So, uh, what I'd like from each of you, if possible, is just your final thoughts. You know, or the, the things you haven't been able to say that you wanted to say, and what you think sport as a whole can do to go down the same path you have done and to take uh, take sustainability and social impact seriously. So Ali, should we start with you? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I, I would say that we're at a crossroads at the moment and you know, sustainability is a bit of a buzzword at the moment, but it, it's gonna be a part of doing business. So I don't think anyone can afford to, to have it in a CSR part of their business and you know, we do sustainability over there. It's got to be core. It's got to be part of, of everyone's business. And we've all got to get our heads around that. And I think what, where sport is, is sport is, um, uh, it, 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 it relates to communities. It's trusted by communities. People, you know, they can be divorced multiple times, but they still love the same football club that they loved from, from the age of seven. You know, it's, it's, it's a lifelong relationship. And so I think sport's got a very, very, um, uh, trusted sort of uh, relationship with fans which can be used in the right way and, and that's not preaching and, and and what i what i found so compelling today about, about henry's um club is you know they're going out there and they're they're showing people how it can be done and, and you know i've run a football club before and and i can tell you going and building a new stadium is really really tough and you know especially when you're doing it from probably the most expensive material that you can possibly imagine. But the point is, is it's changing people's mindsets and it's encouraging other people to, to come with you. And I think that's the point is as long as we can, we can do this in a pragmatic way, which can involve people, involve communities and then aggregate those communities together. You've got something that's really, really powerful. And that's what, what, you know, gets me excited, gets me out of bed in the morning is, is, is that excitement about making a difference, making an impact, and making a change. Brilliant. Peter, in two minutes, what are you, what's your final <laughs> points? Possibly, I mean, yeah, I would echo all that Ali just said. I think that your, your responsible business uh, of which sustainability is a part will be the only way to operate in the future. If you want to survive as a sport or as an organization, you will have to move well beyond the pure profit and loss of, of, of what you do um, and sustainability will have to be at the core of that so i do think yeah that's important i think yeah a bit of it comes back to the but for sport as a whole i think a bit of it comes back to the well-worn and hackneyed um repeating of, of i think it was oh. Mahatma, wasn't it? which is you have to be the change you want to see in the world yeah sports organizations in the way that i mean forest green i have to say is not a story i knew um very impressive um because they're sticking to the story and they are not letting anything move them from that path and i think that's really impressive you have to live this thing not just be a platform for somebody else to do it you know so just you know you know so i think that's the key thing sport has to move to the center of the debate not just be the platform on which all brands like us have the debate and i think as i said that that's both about the business they run and the sport they they compete in and i think you know um now is the time to start and in fact you know we know from both today and from other discussions that many sports that you know have have already you know started on that journey and henry final point from you uh, I think the most common thing I hear is that it's difficult to go green or where do I start or you know, whatever. We, we get loads of associations and, and the teams coming to us. 
but really to just do something, just do anything to start, um, you know, put a vegan option on your menu. You're not getting rid of a fan favorite burger, but put a vegan option on there, see how it sells. Wimbledon did it two years ago and they put strawberries and vegan cream next to their strawberries and cream um, that outsold it that year. So just do something and then do something else and do something else and stop making excuses. So I think, and absolutely think great thing to, uh, to end on. There is no reason for excuses anymore. And I think if, if the social and moral argument doesn't win you, I think I'll finish on quoting the governor of Bank, the Bank of England when he was Mark Carney, who said uh, in 10 to 15 years, any, any organization or any business who is not taking sustainability seriously will probably not be with us anymore. So I think uh, you guys are, are, are leading the way in exemplifying what sustainability looks like. And it's been an absolute privilege to talk to you. So I will hand back over to Sid. Thanks very much indeed, Mike, for a very professionally moderated panel. And what a great panel it was, a truly engaging discussion on a very personal subject. And also a really high amount of engagement from the audience, which is always great to see. Now, we could have gone on a lot longer, but as is often the case in the interest of time, we will have to leave it there. Quite a lot, though, was unpacked during the session with Ali talking about the RMS St. Helena which actually functions as a floating paddock, cutting down carbon emissions by 75%, just by avoiding air freight. He also spoke about the hydrogen fuel cells, which only create a byproduct, which is water, thereby making sure that all cars are zero emission. Henry spoke about a number of innovations, including 100% green energy, solar powered pitch mowers, a 100% vegan menu for both fans and players, as well as the eco park, which should perhaps be ready in three to four seasons going on to become the world's first all wooden football stadium. And Peter spoke about the importance of inclusion, of diversity, as well as how as a sponsor aligning with brands that have the same values, vision and priorities is crucial. We also had a lot of engagement from the audience. Uh, speaking of which, let's revisit the polls and check out the results. So in the first poll question, we asked you which one of the following green initiatives do you think will play the most crucial role in sustainability? 46% of the audience believe it will be renewable or clean energy, which is followed by reduced single-use plastic with 38%. In the second poll question, we asked you, do sports organizations need to do more to push messaging about creating a better planet? And an emphatic, unanimous opinion from the audience, 100% of you believe sports organizations do need to do more in order to push the messaging about creating a better planet. Now, as we get close to wrapping up, I'd like to say a massive thank you once again to our panelists, Ali Russell, CMO Extremi, Peter Thomas, CMO Accenture, and Henry Stalens, CEO at Forest Green Rovers Football Club. A huge thank you as well to Mike Penrose, founder and partner at the Sustainability Group, for steering this conversation skillfully and making it ever so enjoyable. Thank you all for tuning in and being such an engaged audience. Please do join us for our next session where we will discuss governance in sport and its increasing importance going forward. That session takes place on Thursday, the 10th of September at 3 p.m. UK time. We hope you can join us then for what promises to be yet another engaging discussion. In the meantime, you can keep across all our talking sport content and information about the series on the 11 Sports Twitter and LinkedIn pages, as well as the iSport Connect social channels. We also have upcoming sessions on sports tech, user-generated content, and finally, diversity. So there's plenty more still to come. Well, that's all from me. Thanks ever so much for joining us. And we hope to see you all soon. Stay safe, have a lovely rest of the week. Thank you and goodbye.